Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Well, you did good getting here early this morning after last night being here. Hello. <laughs> That's one of my grandsons. All right. Well, <clears throat> we're going to look at several points this morning. I've been uh, talking, and the, the whole purpose of the Sunday morning Bible schools are to train up the local body here. And so if you're from here and you're here normally on Sunday, then uh, this is for you. Uh, those watching by internet also that tune in regularly and part of the church. Uh, worldwide that joins with us. Uh, it is for you also is to train up. If you're a visitor and you're just stopping in, you can learn from it. Uh, if you would like to continue learning, then you can also sign up online and, and uh, watch by internet also. But we, the whole purpose is to train you and equip you because <clears throat> over the next um, you know, couple of years especially, we're going to be seeing a massive influx of people that are coming here to get help. And so we want you trained to be able to help them you know, as well as myself and our staff, and, and honestly, <clears throat> you know, Jesus had 12, and that was overwhelming, and, and they were overwhelmed, I might say, and so he had to ordain another 70 also, so that's the process that we're following. So, you can turn to, and, and you don't actually have to turn here, but you might want to take some notes, but we are going to be looking at some things here in just a moment. Uh, <clears throat> last week, we were talking about how to receive from God, how to receive your healing or, or anything else that God has promised, how to receive that. So we want to talk today, specifically, and do some teaching today, along the lines of how to activate and release the power of God. So we want to teach you how to receive from God, but also how to give out what you have received from God and be able to minister to others. So we're going to go over this, and this is, um, part of this will come from the DHT that you may and hopefully have already uh, heard either before or during the last few days that we've been teaching here. <clears throat> but part of it will be from that, but then also we're going to go a little more in depth on how to, uh, the, the first part will be on more how to activate it and get it effective in your life, but then how to release it, and then we're going to get some specifics. So uh, if you do have a DHD manual, we're just going to take from part of that right there on the secrets, John G. Lake's Secrets of Spiritual Power. Now, this is not just going to be rehashing the same thing here. We're going to go over these, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to move quickly <clears throat> into how to, and, and this is about how to activate it, but then also how to release it, and that's the key we want to get to. So we're going to go through the, the secrets. We call them secrets. They're not secrets anymore. We've been preaching them for, you know, all around the world for the last you know, 20, 25 years, so they're really not secrets. Uh, they may be ignored, but they're not secrets. So we're going to start with number one. Number one is just simply this. There has to be a degree of what is generally called spiritual hunger. <clears throat> now, we don't emphasize the, the terminology of spiritual hunger, but because we're not saying that we're going to get on our, you know, up here at the altar and cry out, God, we're hungry for you. God, we need more. That's, that's not the type of spiritual hunger we're talking about. Uh, Jesus said that if you eat his flesh, that if you drink his blood and eat his flesh, and if you, if you come to him and you drink of the water that he gives you, you will never hunger and never thirst. And so when people every Sunday gather up around an altar and somewhere, a platform or something, and start crying out to God how they hunger and thirst, it just tells me they don't know the Bible and they don't even know what they're looking for. Right? And if you ask for the wrong thing, then you're, you know, don't be surprised when you get what you're not looking for. Right? So... <clears throat> we're going to call this, uh, just because it is a common term, when I say spiritual hunger, what we're talking about is an intense desire, not for more of God, but for you to walk in and release the things that God has already deposited within you. Right? So it's more of a getting out of the way. But there has to be some type of desire there, or you wouldn't even, you know, you, you have some desire, you wouldn't even be sitting here today. So all we're talking about is that to really move into the things of God, there has to sometimes be a little more intense desire than the average churchgoer has. Because you have to have something more, or you would just come to church, sit here on Sunday, and go back you know, about your daily life, and just live a normal, quote-unquote, life. And so there has to be somewhat more of an intense desire. And that desire is for the fulfillment of spiritual results. You want more results in your life, you have to push for it. Now, when I say push, it's not a yearning, groaning, that kind of thing, but it is a desire to learn and to walk in the things you have, which is, <clears throat> this is actually going to tie over into both 
services this morning. So we would say that it's not a desire for more of God. It's a desire for more results that God can pour through you. That's the key. We're not going to God and saying, God, give me more. God, give me more. No, he's already given you Jesus. And in Jesus dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead. So all of that is in you. So you're not trying to get more of God. Well, you're really, really what you need is less of you. And so it's really a dying to some things that is really going to, what's going to help you. So first off, now we do have a scripture. And that is Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. That simply says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, notice that, after righteousness. That means after being right with God. Now, when you get born again, you are made right with God. Okay? So that hunger and thirst there is to get to a state. As a Christian, you are in that state. Okay? And then you simply go from there and you... And you the key is to awake to righteousness, like the scripture says, to know you're righteous and not keep trying to get more of God, but to say, you know what? God has made me right with him. Now let's walk this out. And, you know, I've met people that have absolutely no desire for the things of God. And I, I am just, you know, to use an old word, I'm flabbergasted. Okay, it just I don't understand somebody that doesn't have a thing, you know, a, a desire for the things of God. I just don't get it. But I've met people like that. And then I've met some people that have just enough desire for God that they think it will keep them out of hell. You know, just enough, you know, and they don't want to go too far because they think if you go beyond that, you're getting radical. You know, you're some type of fanatic. Well, <clears throat> fanatic is what people that are ice cold toward God call people that love God. Okay, so there's, you just know. So, <clears throat> now, notice he says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You hear that? That hunger. Now, if you've uh, read any of Dr. Lake's material, any of his sermons, he has a sermon that he actually called Spiritual Hunger. And it's funny because uh, he had a little booklet uh, that Gordon Lindsay produced uh, for Christ of Nations, and it was a book of sermons. And when that book first came out, I have one of the first copies of that book. And it's funny because they've changed the name now uh, because it didn't sit right with people. And they even changed the name of one of Dr. Lake's sermons in it uh, toward spiritual hunger uh, as opposed to, because it talks about spiritual hunger and it talks about uh, men, basically the sons of God and walking with God and that kind of thing. And it's funny because <clears throat> they used to call it uh, spiritual hunger, the God men, and other sermons. And because they used God-men, people kind of got freaked out. And they thought, well, he, he's saying we're gods. And he said, but that wasn't the intent if you read it, but they changed the title just to keep from getting any flack. And they actually changed Dr. Lake's sermon. And Dr. Lake went in and, and actually taught off of uh, John chapter 10, verse 34, where he said, I said ye are gods, and then he explains all that. So, But people just see a word and they don't think it's like they panic, and they run off, and then they talk about something they don't even know about. So don't do that. Investigate. Now, <clears throat> how do you develop a, a spiritual desire, an intense desire? And we would even call it a spiritual appetite, you know, an appetite for the things of the Spirit. Well, you do it the same way that you develop a physical hunger, a physical appetite. You have to increase the energy output that will require greater input. Okay, what that means is this. You have to do things you've never done. For instance, when I started to go into the uh, military, I went in, talked to the recruiter, got everything set up, and we went through all the tests, did all the stuff, and he said, this is all good, but he said, you are too far underweight, and you have to gain weight, and you have to be at this weight to get in. And so on the day of your en enlistment, he said, we will weigh you again, and we can give you a waiver for this, we can give you a waiver for that, but you have to come up at least to this to get the waiver, <clears throat> which was hilarious to think about now, but um, because I remember I had to get up to 109 pounds. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and, and then when I went in the military, I ate really good and gained up above that. And then I went to work for the uh, corrections department for Texas and became a correctional officer. And uh, that's where I ate the best. 
Let me tell you, the Texas prison system, I don't know about the prisoners, but the guards eat really good, all right? <laughs> Which is really strange because the prisoners make the food for the guards, so you'd think that we'd be a little hesitant to eat some of it, but they had some good food there, a whole lot of biscuits and gravy, and that'll pack on some weight real quick. So, <laughs> so. I had a man tell me one time, he said, Brother Curry, they told me that if I'd quit eating biscuits and gravy, I could add another 10 years to my life. And I said, well, what kind of life would it be for 10 years without biscuits and gravy? I said, there's a certain level of quality of life that you have to go for. So anyway, but so the way I had to, because I was eating normal, but the way to gain weight, I had to force myself to eat more than I was used to eating. And I had to actually eat more, and then I would get used to eating more, and then I would eat more on a regular basis, and that's how I ended up gaining the weight. Well, it's the same thing with spiritual things. If you want to grow in spiritual things, what got you where you are it will not get you where you want to go. So you have to start increasing certain things. Uh, if you want a greater appetite, you have to force feed yourself some. So maybe you're not reading the Word enough during the week. Maybe you only hear it on, you know, in church on Sunday or something. But if you want to have an increase of appetite for the things of God, start setting yourself to discipline yourself to read the Word of God on a regular basis. Just like you would say, well, I'm going to take uh, you know, supplements or vitamins or something. You have to take it three times a day with each meal. You have to discipline yourself. You know, you're going to forget a couple of times when you first start. and You have to remind yourself, and then you have to set a schedule when you start doing it. <clears throat> Years ago... Uh, probably 30 some odd years ago now, over, yeah, closer to 40 years, <clears throat> I made a decision that I wanted to start studying more. And so I started reading more and I started setting certain times of the day and I had those certain times that I would read. I'd read when I got up, and but mainly I would read when I went to bed at night. And honestly, for the last, you know, over 30 years now, it, you know, by the time it took hold, so to speak, I could not remember one night that I've ever gone to sleep without reading something spiritual. Bible, good book, you know, on spiritual things, something along those lines. And it is actually hard for me to go to sleep without reading something. And because I've developed the spiritual appetite for it. Now, by the same token, I don't have bad dreams. I don't have nightmares. I don't have any, why? Because I fill my soul with the things of the Word of God and the enemy has no room to work. Right? People come to me all the time, you know, I just always have these bad dreams. I said, well, you know, what are you doing before you go to bed? What do you, what do you, what's the last thing you watch? What's the last thing you read? What are you thinking about? And invariably, <clears throat> it's something that would bring these things about. And so I have good dreams, you know. When I first started, you know, the monster would chase me. Now I chase the monster, right? <clears throat> that's, that's not a nightmare, amen? That's a good dream, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, but you have to set and develop yourself to start, and, and you have to kind of push yourself in the beginning and get the discipline to start reading more than you had before. And you just start reading it, and then you set up the discipline, and then that will increase your appetite. And before long, you don't have to force yourself. You desire it, right? Now, this is a key. This is one of the, the secrets, as we said. Now, <clears throat> second part. Uh, for, well, let me go even further than that. Not just reading things, but this applies to everything. If you want to have a stronger prayer life, Force yourself to pray more than you're used to. And then develop the habit of praying. People say, well, a habit of praying? Yeah, I mean a habit of like times to pray and not the habit of saying a, the same prayer, right? So it's not the habit of quoting the same thing over and over. It's the habit of being in the habit of saying, I'm going to take this time to pull aside and pray. And you can do that and then you can do it maybe, you know, once in the morning, one at night, and then you can add another one at lunch, and then you can add another one in the afternoon, and then you can add another one in the morning, and pretty soon you've got all this stuff, and, and you have more time praying than you have time not praying, right? You say, yeah, but I work a job. That, that's good. You can pray in tongues. You can pray in tongues at the same time you're reading and doing your job. Why? You say, well, how does that work? Because you're not using your mind to pray in tongues. It's, you're praying out of your spirit, and your mind is unfruitful. So if your mind is unfruitful in that point, then you can use your mind to do other things. That's one of the ways that you can tell if you have truly received the baptism of the Spirit with speaking other tongues. If you can't read something and understand it in your normal language and pray in tongues at the same time, your tongues are probably not by the Spirit and it is more soulish in the sense that it's you. Right? It's just a good test. So <clears throat> Now, uh, let's see, number two. Feeding on the Word of God. We've kind of talked about that, but there are three parts to feeding on the Word of God. 
First, there's read, there's study, and there's meditate. Reading means you take a portion of Scripture and get the overall idea of that passage. Right? You just read it. You go, okay, I know what's going on here. I get the, I get the picture. <clears throat> then <clears throat> you go in and you study. And the study means you start taking the Scripture apart. You maybe get a Greek or Hebrew, whichever Scripture you're reading from, and you get a, a Greek or Hebrew uh, concordance. And you take that whole scripture apart, word by word, and you look up each word. <clears throat> and it's always good if you can, at the same time when you're take, looking at each word, that you take a little notepad and you write down the definition of each word, and you fill it out, and then when you get done, you should have a better translation of that verse based on the, on the dictionary of the Greek or Hebrew. It's just a good quick way <clears throat> of seeing if the translation you're using is any good, right? There are some good translations out there, and there are some terrible translations out there, right? There are certain translations that, honestly, you know, if I if I personally had the money, and I heard you had that kind of Bible, I'd say, you bring that Bible, I'll buy you another Bible and give you another Bible, just to get you out of that thing. Um, and then there are times when certain <clears throat> translations are good for you at that point in your development, but hopefully you move quickly on through it, right? Uh, some of them, and, and I've read these, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I read these early on and <coughs> realized that they were not saying what the Bible said, so I quickly retired them and found better translations. But probably two of the worst is, number one, the Message Bible. Probably one of the worst. It's not even a translation. It is a version, right? It's not even called a translation. And then, of course, the other one is, actually, it's called a translation, but the man who wrote it had no qualifications to write it. And so he, he actually wrote it for his children and his grandkids, and he just wrote out nice little things. And again, it does not hold true, and that's called the Living Bible. The Living Bible, the Living New Testament, those things. So neither one of those are worth reading. And if you want it, you say, well, but it's easy reading. Well, just because it's easy, if it's not worth reading, it's not worth reading whether it's easy or not, right? And it's definitely not worth you reading to your kids. It'd be better for you to read to them in old King James and translate it for them and explain it to them. Right? Because at least then you'd be going from something somewhat accurate. So, <clears throat> and there are other ones. Um, for instance, like the uh, God's Word Bible. Really not that accurate. It's, it's better than <laughs> the message, but it's really not good. Even, even the Amplified is not that accurate. Even the, and the amazing thing is the Amplified Bible is used all over the world, and yet it is not that accurate in many places. It adds stuff in to help you get an understanding, and sometimes it's just not accurate, right? Um, <clears throat> now, the, the Weiss New Testament is, you probably heard me mention it before, it's an expanded translation of the New Testament. By far, it is the most accurate and best New Testament. It's not always that easy to read just because of the way it's worded, because it, it really focuses on giving you exactly what a Greek-speaking person would understand the, the New Testament to say, and it brings, it, all, it brings out all of the meaning of the words in it. So it's very, very good, very accurate, but again, not that easy to read. Right? <clears throat> so far, as I've mentioned recently, the ESV, the English Standard Version, seems to be a pretty good translation. Easy to read, still very accurate. Actually, it really surprised me. When I first picked it up, I wasn't expecting that much. Uh, but as I read it, there was even some places I read something like, wait a minute, let me go check it out and go check it out. And sure enough, it was more accurate than the King James. It's more accurate than some of the others. And I thought, this is going to be a pretty good Bible. And so now I haven't read all the way through the ESV. So if you have read a place where there is a mistake or whether it's a bad translation or something, let me know because we're trying to make sure that we let people know what's going on. So, <clears throat> but you first read, get the overall idea, then you study, you take a verse apart, word for word, you get the definitions, and then finally you meditate. Once you get it all broke down and you know what it says, then you begin to meditate on that scripture. And meditate doesn't mean, you know, sitting cross-legged with your fingers and, you know, humming ohm, all right? That's not it. <clears throat> I don't know if you, this is kind of a by the way, and I know I don't have a lot of extra time, but we are going through a time in this country where people have lost their way 
and they're looking for stuff. And everything that we used to know as solid has been shaken, it seems like. And a lot of people, even that would never do certain things, will do these other things now just because they're willing to try anything. Uh, not too long ago, somebody sent me a, a clip, and I believe, who was it? Yes, um, late night TV talk show host uh, Conan O'Brien. He had Jeff Bridges on his program. And <clears throat> this clip is about 15 minutes long. And Jeff Bridges said, they were talking about how he seems all calm and peaceful and all this kind of stuff. And he said, well, yeah, I meditate a lot. And they started talking about it. And he said, matter of fact, let's do, an ex let's do a, a little exercise. Kind of O'Brien, it was all ad lib, you could tell, because, you know, based on O'Brien's response. And Jeff Bridges said, we're going to do it this way. And he said, this group over here, you start doing this. And they had him start doing the OM thing. <clears throat> One day he said, then he pointed to another group, and they started doing it. And then he pointed to another, and they made it. You know how that, that old song, you know, row, row, row your boat, and then you would have, if they call it a round song? They did that with each group, picking it up, and they kept the sound going for almost 15 minutes. And they had everybody in the audience <coughs> going along with them and meditating, in this sense, and making that sound, which is a demonic sound, and which is used to summon demons to give the meditator wisdom, right? Which the Bible says would be a devilish wisdom from this earth, and it comes from spirit beings. And yet, the amazing thing is, they, they pan the, uh, the crowd. I didn't see one person that wasn't doing it. The whole crowd, in other words, whatever they tell you to do, you just do. And, and I'm watching, I'm thinking, right now, not only the people that are there, but anybody else watching that's going along with it or you know participating in it, that kind of thing, demons are coming to them. And, say, and, and it's all under this guise of, oh, it's just an exercise and it'll bring you peace and calmness. It's a false gospel. Right? And we're going to have to be more aware of what's going on and realize the spiritual warfare that is right now greater than it has been in a long time. The last time it was at this level was in the mid-60s that we just saw this kind of, of spiritual attacks, we would say, on everything that is godly and, and holy. I was watching, I'm really kind of getting off here and don't have a lot of time. I was watching, um, <clears throat> a lot of times whenever I get in at night, just to kind of, you know, get my mind to let go, I will watch a, like some of the old newsreels. I have a pretty vast library of the, a lot of the World War II type stuff, the, the newsreels, the, uh, Victory series, why we fight, and and they talked about the Nazis and they talked about everything going on. It was really it's really fascinating, and they, they talked about the Japanese and and the Italians. I mean, it was you know everybody pretty much, but it was things that the American government put together, and it is amazing how many times in films that were talking about these things, how they would say these people um, <clears throat> atheistic, godless, and then they would refer to America as you know God loving people. And, you know, our forefathers, I mean, it's just amazing how many times they invoke the name of God in these films and say the reason we have to fight is for freedom. And they, it's just phenomenal, the difference of what you would hear today and what you would hear back then. So, like I said, it's neither here nor there at this point, but it's just amazing to see the difference. So, point three. Next point. So we've already talked about a spiritual desire. Then we talk about feeding on the Word of God, meditating upon it, thinking about it, speaking it out loud to yourself, and just taking time. Meditation is like chewing something with the mind. You just chew on it. You get all the nourishment out of it. You think about it. You, you say it. You say it over and over. You say it different ways. So, number three, communion with God. You have to have communion with God. Reading the Word can be communion with God, but it can also just be reading the Word. And so you need a time of communion with God. Now, that doesn't mean you have to set apart a time, even though that wouldn't hurt. But <clears throat> there's talking prayer, there's listening prayer, and then there's practicing the presence of the Spirit of God. Okay? Talking prayer is when you talk. Listening prayer is when you quit talking, you shut up, and you let God talk. Okay? Most people don't do that. They come in, Heavenly Father, I need help, I need this thing. Okay, in Jesus' name, thank you, amen, and then they get up and take off. Okay? You, after you spend time talking, it's like somebody calling you on the phone. And whenever you answer, you say hello, and they start talking, and they talk for 15 minutes, and you're trying to answer, and you go, well, yeah, 
no, yeah, yeah, but, 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 you see, and, and they just keep on talking, and finally they say, well, all right, it's been good talking with you, click, and you're like, you know, I, I didn't even get a word in edgewise, right, okay, that's the way God feels most of the time, right, because you just talk, 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 and then you don't stop, and, and whatever you're trying to find out, you don't take time for him to tell you, so at some point, you need to stop talking, and let God talk, right? And listen and hear what he says. So <clears throat> talking prayer, listening prayer, and then there are times when you just need to focus and practice on the fact that Jesus lives in you, that he's here with me. And you need to do this everywhere. Now, again, some of these principles I learned even back whenever I was in martial arts because people in martial arts always practice in their, their gyms, their dojos, their, you know, whatever you, whatever you want to call them, whatever branch you're in. And they always practice there. And they always practice in the uniforms, which, as people say, look like pajamas, very loose fitting. But you don't usually dress that way. And many times they'll practice barefooted, and most people don't always walk around barefooted. And so you have better traction when you're barefooted usually. But, so what, I, what we did when we trained is that we actually would go other places. Because if you just do it in one place, you get familiar there. If you just do it in one type of clothing, I would tell my students, wear to, tonight to the class what you wear to work. Wear what you wouldn't wear on a, on a weekend if you're going to go somewhere. Wear that because you'll find out that what works when you're barefooted doesn't work whenever you've got slick soled shoes. You know, you try to kick to the head, you'll end up on the ground just because you, your foot slides out, right? And so we had, and, and you also find out that with tighter clothes, you can't kick to the head, right? And so you have to be used to, you have to, you have, you will, you have to train the way you're going to fight because you're going to fight the way you train. And so we'd always tell them, wear normal clothing, wear different things like that, and get used to training. And I would take them to places. We would go places, uh, stores, and I'd send somebody in, and then I'd send two other guys in and said, okay, you're going you to act like you don't know each other, and you're going to walk past somebody, and you're going to come up behind him, and one's going to come by and grab you by the wrist, and you're going to respond. And, but now if you do that in a gym, you know, in a school, that's one thing. Do it in a Walmart. Because, see, you have to get your money. Because if, if you're attacked in a Walmart or in a parking lot and you're not in a school, it's a different surrounding and you think differently. And so, and, and generally, you'll be in here and you're all aware when you're in, you know, in here training, but then you go out into a Walmart and you're not aware. You're too busy thinking about this and too busy thinking about that. And that's what criminals look for is people that are preoccupied and not aware of their surroundings. And so we would train them to be aware of their surroundings. So it's the same thing. You need to practice the presence of God everywhere you go. If you're going to go somewhere, take a moment when you get there, just remember, he's with me. Whatever I see in here, I can handle. If somebody needs help, I can do it. I can help them because he is with me. And just take a moment to recognize that his presence is there with you, right? Now, what most people, funny thing is when people say, oh, I feel the presence of God, you know, we're in church and we're doing this and I feel the presence of God. The reason you feel the presence of God is not that he just got there. It's not like you just walked in and you felt his presence. It's because at that moment, you're taking the time to focus on the fact that he is present and your emotions and your feelings start to recognize him. Right? Now, you can be and should be at a place where you are constantly conscious of his presence so that you never feel a time when you don't feel him present. Right? If you... If you if your general uh, state is not aware of his presence and you have to stop and purposely focus to get his presence, then it shows that generally you're not sensitive to his spirit. So you want to start practicing that presence and you want to practice it everywhere you go. Any new store you walk in, just stop in the door and just for a minute and just go, you know what? He's with me. And just focus on that. And then go through there. And then you walk out of there and go to the store next door. When you walk in the door, just, he's with me. And just take time and start taking the time to recognize his constant presence. When you do that, it'll start getting, the, the times when you recognize it will get closer to closer. And pretty soon, you're conscious of it all the time. Right? Now, that doesn't mean you're going to feel goosebumps or warm oil or anything else all the time. Right? It's just like having a person with you and you're conscious of their presence with you. It's, it's exactly the same thing. You don't have to feel something, you just know they're there, right? And so, and you can talk to them, and you can laugh and feel one thing. Uh, you can, they can tell you what they saw on the news and get you sad, and, you know, you can cry. And, and it's all part of their presence, but it's not necessarily part of them. 
it's what you're talking about that causes the emotion. You get that? All right, so <clears throat> communion with God. Now we're talking about talking prayer, listening prayer, and practicing the presence of God. Now, number four, this is a big one, <clears throat> and we've even had questions on it this weekend. Number four is fellowship with like-minded Christians. So many people come to me and say, I'm at this church, I'm doing this, and you know, and they say this, and I know that's not true, or I know this, or I tell them what I'm doing, and they don't like it, and they tell me to stop. Should I stay at that church, or should I go? All right, first off, follow truth. If you hear, and I, and I don't want to say how much, um, it wouldn't take very much non-truth for me to hear, for me to leave a church, right? But it's because I am secure in my relationship with God, and I'm, I do not need a relationship with a particular church body to keep a relationship with God, Amen. right? Here's another thing. People say, well, you know, I feel like going over to that church, and, but they tell me if I leave this church, I'm being wrong. And I'm not. Okay, <clears throat> listen carefully. You follow truth. You go where you're fed. You go where you get truth. And just because you leave one building to go to another building does not mean you've left the church. There's only one church church Amen. right we are and if you if they name the name of christ and if they are born again we're all part of the same family and it, you know one part of the family shouldn't get mad if you're fellowshipping with another part of the family right and usually that's territorialism and honestly if you still kept sending in your tithes and offerings they would don't care where you go just the way it is right so but you I have people say, you know, should I leave, should I not? You should follow truth. Go where you're fed, follow truth, walk in truth, and, and not just hear truth. Because you can hear somebody preaching truth and yet say, but you're not ready. So just, just stay and don't do anything. Just listen and feed on the Word of God. That right there would be enough for me to leave a church. Right? Because their job is to equip me so that I can do the work of the ministry, so that I can help people. Their job is not to corral me and keep me pacified. Right? If anything, their job is to stir me up and give me a greater desire to do the things of God. Amen. Right? So, <clears throat> now, number, well, still number four, fellowship with like-minded Christians. You need to get around people that believe like you do. If there's none in your area, win somebody. Right? Win them, then disciple them into truth. Right? I have a lot of people say, well, you know, there's nobody in my area. Well, now that's an indictment on you. Win somebody, right? Go out, talk to somebody. You can find somebody. Somebody's go. One of the best places to find people uh, that you can fellowship with is Christian bookstores. Yeah. Go to a Christian bookstore. Go to the, you know, they always have the different sections. Go to the charismatic, spirit-filled life section. See who's hanging out there, right? <laughs> Start talking to them, right? You know, Create a relationship. Start talking with them. You know, exchange phone numbers, exchange emails, however you want to do it, and say, hey, let's keep talking. Matter of fact, I got some stuff I'd like to share with you. And start sharing with them and see. You know, send them some material. Send them a DHT. Tell them to go to the website. Go to YouTube. Watch this. I'm here to answer questions if you need it. And, and just start that relationship. And then from there, say, hey, why don't we meet somewhere? And we'll just get together. If you know any friends, bring them in. That's the way that works, right? And so you start gathering people together. And you create a life team. Right? It's that, it, it really is that easy. Now, you know, you, and, you know, you may want to win somebody that's not saved. That's great. You can do that too. The main thing is, is that you get people together and you start discipling, you start teaching, you start fellowshipping with them. So you need to hang around people that believe like you do. Right? The scripture is even very clear. You don't marry people that don't believe. Right? You, just, you, you don't get unequally yoked with unbelievers. That now, that doesn't mean you don't talk to them. That doesn't mean you, you know, shun them, right? It just means you don't marry them, that you don't, that you don't spend the majority of your time with more people that don't believe like you believe, right? You need to find people who believe like you believe, and if, like I said, if you can't find them, create some, right? Train them and go from there, and they should be helping you sharpen and you sharpen them, and your growth should be there. This is, this is really simple stuff if you get down to it. Uh, number, well, part B of this is if the people in your church are dead and resist, resistant to this truth, leave that dumb dead thing. All right? Is that, is that clear enough for you? All right? Yeah. Okay. Find a place that accepts it. If there's no place like that near you, start one. You're a missionary. All right? Hey, Jude. 
<laughs> Number five, public confession of who you are in Christ and who he is in you. Now, this is one of the key things, and it is the reason why we put together this little booklet, acknowledging what is in you. And what it does is we took scriptures that have to do with who we are in Christ and who he is in us, and we put them into the first person, and then we you know, put them out and we started going along with them. And we say things like, my words are seasoned with grace, and they bring edification to every person under the sound of my voice. I will speak that which is true, and I will speak the truth in love. And you just begin to say that. What do you do? You're acknowledging what the scripture says is in you, and you're saying this is a truth in me and to me, and I believe it. And the more you speak it out, and especially out loud, the more it goes out of your mouth, back into your ear, and helps retrain your brain. Now, and I'm not going to get into the mind renewal thing this morning, but I will tell you this. You, you really can't think two thoughts at the same time. And so if you're saying this, you're thinking this. And every time you say it and you think it, that thought is reinforced and creates a stronger connection with other thoughts because it goes in and tries to find connections and it starts to build on itself. So the more you do this, the stronger it gets and the faster you renew your mind, right? It's just that simple. So people say, well, you know, how often do I have to do that? The rest of your life. You know, you know how long, how often? I, it, you know, why, why think that way? In other words, think I'm training myself into being the person I already am. And, but, and the only reason I'm not, I haven't been living that way is because this, my head, has not lined up with my spirit. Well, this is how you get your head to line up with your spirit, right? And you just take it and say it and say it and say it and say it and out loud. And you say, but, you know, I just have to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Yep. Repetition is the mother of memory, right? And you build the memory. And once you have a memory, then you st it'll start to cause you to function different and to move different and to do different, right? This is probably one of the, if not the fastest way to change your life. As simple as that is. And people say, well, that's just too simple. Yep. That's probably why God chose it. Because he chooses the foolish to compound the wise, right? It's just the way it works. And some people say, well, you know, I don't believe in that confession stuff. Yeah, I know, and it shows. <laughs> we can tell you don't believe in it, okay? So, <clears throat> now, so we, we do that, and we've made these little booklets so you can carry with you and to, to be able to do it anywhere. And now, understand, I don't care one of these booklets, booklets. Why? Because I've been doing this long enough that it's in me. I can stop anywhere and just start going through stuff. And you can... Take it in areas that you need the most help in. You know, if you're sick and you need help, you can take the scriptures on healing and put those out. If you need help in finances, you can take the scriptures on finances, and there are a lot of them, right? God wasn't afraid to talk about finances, right? And you start saying those things out and saying what God said about it, and you can do it in any area. You can do it in areas of the mind and having peace. You can start begin to say the things that the scriptures say about a peaceful mind and being at peace and staying in peace. And I tell you, if you do that on a regular basis, every time a thought comes up that says, oh, what are we going to do? It's, it's bad. It's going to be bad. Right? You go, okay, wait. And you get that book and you put that in front of your eyes and you say it. Right? And you say it until that other voice shuts up. Right? And every time it says it, you hit it back. Just like play, playing uh, tennis or ping pong. Yeah. Right? He lobs one at you and you lob it right back. Right? You know, or, or as some of you with your history, you'd be like playing poker. I'll see that and I'll call you on this. You know, I'll, I'll raise you, right? So, not asking for a show of hands. We're just talking here. Now, so public confession of who you are in Christ and who he is in you. There's some basic ones right here. There's about six I have here. I'm just going to go through them quickly. And they are in your DHT manual. If you have a manual, it's on page 174. But the first one that everybody ought to make is that Jesus is Lord. Now, you don't just make that one time. You make that the rest of your life. And you, you get, should get up in the morning and just make that statement out. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord over me. He's Lord over my family. He's Lord over my nation, my finances, my home, my health. And you just start establishing the Lordship of Jesus in each of these areas. And you can say, maybe that's the main one you need to work on. And you just get stronger and stronger. And the, the stronger emotion you can tie with the words you're saying, the stronger the connection is made in your brain between the two. Right? So, now, I'm, listen carefully. I'm not saying that if you stand around and yell this and scream it, that it's going to make it happen faster or that God's going to do it faster. It, it has nothing to do with that. The emotion part is how it helps connect with you so that it may help you believe it faster so that, and when you believe, you get what you believe and you get what you say if you believe what you're saying. 
So the first part, and the whole message of confession, people don't like it a lot of times, but it's real simple. First you say it, and you say it until you believe it. Amen. Then you say it because you believe it. And when you're saying it because you believe it, you'll have what you're saying. All right? You want the, the confession message? That's it in a nutshell. Those three parts right there. So uh, another one you can say is the Great Commission. Uh, Matthew 28 and Mark 16. And I go into all the world. I do preach the gospel. I do cast out devils. I do lay hands on the sick. And as I preach the gospel to every creature, they get saved. And I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. And I do cast out devils. And you just, you just quote the Great Commission, right? And you say, but I, but I don't do those things. Well, then you're going to have to go do them, or you're going to be a liar, right? And you don't want to be a liar, so go do them, right? So now, the next is the golden rule. Everybody knows this one, or at least if you were... In school, when I was in school, they used to teach this. Now it's, you know, illegal to teach, I guess. But it's Matthew 7, 12 that basically just says, I treat people the way I want to be treated. I do to them what I would want done for me. And you just say that out loud, and you say it, and you say it, and, and it gets in you, and it causes you to start thinking. Whatever you say, if I said, you know, a blue elephant, I mean, right now you're picturing a blue elephant, you can't help it. You can't, it just go right there. And if I said, listen, do not think about a blue elephant, Right? Too late. It's going to happen, right? As soon as I mention it, you already go there. So whenever you say these things, you're automatically directing your mind in a certain area, which means you're directing your mind away from something else, right? Because you can't think about I know this thing about multitasking. Multitasking is a myth. Yeah. I, I know you may be very good at doing a lot of things at one time, but that's not. Multitasking means doing this, two things at the same time. That's not what happens. What happens is your mind switches very quickly. But it's never doing the same thing at the same time. Your mind has to shift focus. And the more things you're trying to do, the more it shifts focus. That's one of the problems we're seeing right now in even mental development is that people are not being taught to think deeply and focus on one thing. Most people do not have focus that they can just simply think about one thing and kind of drown everything else out and just focus on one thing. Most people can't do that today. And it, a lot of it has to do with television programming because you're trained about every two and a half, three minutes, they're going to come on with a commercial for that are going to be 30 and 60 and 90 second commercials, and they're going to do a half a dozen of them, and they're going to have your mind you know, jumping from one thing to another and then coming back into the program, whatever it is you're watching. And they do that to keep you interested, but also they change the picture so that it'll draw you, and they try to keep your mind going from one thing to another to keep you interested. Because if they do one thing too long, you will lose interest and start wandering in your thought, and they don't want that. So they are helping develop what most people call ADHD and all that kind of stuff because they're teaching your mind not to focus on any one point for any length of time. Okay? And yet you go back, and, and this is really why uh, in the old days you see these monks sitting in the monasteries, and all they did was write the scriptures constantly. And they did it because they were focusing as they wrote them. Right? They focused on the words, but also in how they wrote them, and they were able to focus and take everything else out. And they were some of the best thinkers that have ever existed because they, were, they learned and trained themselves to think deeply. Right? So you need to think deeply on these things. Uh, next one, the abiding anointing. You just say out of 1 John 2, 27, I have an anointing that abides. The anointing of God abides within me. And that's exactly what the scripture says, and you just say that over and over again. Power over the enemy, Luke 10, 19. I have power to tread upon all serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy, and, be, and nothing shall by any means hurt me. You just begin to say these things, and initially you'll say them in King James or whatever version you read, but eventually it should be a part of you to where it just comes out in your normal vocabulary. Now, and then number six, praying in tongues. This is a number one way to stir up and activate the, the power of God in you. you. You speak out the word of God. Why do you think healing meetings are so good after somebody preaches? It's, because, it's not because the people have faith. It's because the person preaching has been saying the word of God. They are built up, activated, and ready to release. You get that? Now, if the people have faith raised up and they're ready to receive, it makes it even better. But at the same time, it's because they have been speaking the word of God, and that's why many times they'll have prayer meetings and different things. But praying in tongues is a primary way to get built up. It says building yourself up in your most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Ghost. That means praying in other tongues, and there's maintenance tongues, and then there's warfare tongues. There's all these different areas, but you can build yourself up by speaking in other tongues, and you build it up so that it's ready to release. And to release, it's very simple. You, all you have to do is decide. You decide, right now, I'm going to release the power of God into this situation. But again, you need to focus and not say into this situation where you got all these things going on. You need to be able to focus and say, I'm going to release the power of God right now. Right? And you'll be able to focus and release. You can release through words, through laying on of hands, as I said last night, even through cloth or through, uh, you know, just, just a look. You can, you can believe it. You, you know looks work, right? Men, you know looks work. Isn't that right? When that woman looks at you that certain way, it's like, okay, I got to go. I, I, you know, I mean, you, you know, right? I mean, it's right there. So you, they get that, or, or your children, you know, they should know that look, right? They should know, and they, you give them that look, and they're like, oh, I'm in trouble, you know? And then they act real good because they hope you'll forget before you get home, right? So, so, and then finally, number seven, action. To activate and release the power of God, you have to have action. You have to move and do the thing that you're trying to believe. You can act yourself into believing. Amen? Now, this is very simple. Uh, <clears throat> basically, that's, that's really the, the end of, of, of the lesson this morning. But I want you to get, that's how you activate it, and then you just release it. Right? And you release it at a time. Now, here's the main key about releasing is that once you release, you don't keep going back to it. You, you, you focus, you decide, I'm releasing the power of God, it's done, and you don't keep revisiting it. Now, if a person keeps coming back, yes, you, you give to any man that asks you, you minister to them again. But if it is for you to believe for something, you release it, and, and if it comes back up in your mind, you go, that's done. Because you can tell. Now, if it comes back up and it's God trying to get you to do something, that's one thing. There will be a totally different sensing about it. But if it's from a, oh, I, you, you, you didn't do enough. You didn't finish. Okay, that's when you go, no, no, no. That's, see, that's the devil's voice. I did do enough. See, God will never say you didn't do enough. What he'll say is, here, do this. Right? But the devil says, you didn't do enough. What if you didn't do enough? What if it doesn't work? It's not going to work because you didn't do enough. See, he comes from the negative side, and when that comes up, you go, no, I did enough. I did everything I was supposed to do, therefore I'm standing. Right? And you don't move off of that. When you move off of that, you move into doubt and unbelief. So once you release and you say, this is done, you count it done, you settle it, and then the enemy comes along and says something, you go, nope, it's done. Right? And he's just lobbing that thing at you, and you're just lobbing it right back. Right? So, did you get anything out of this this morning? Yeah. All right, something we can work on. So I'm going to go ahead and release you. We've got about 10 minutes till our 10 a.m. service. So uh, and we have a lot of this material also in the bookstore if you want to go in there. And some other things that we have going. So we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. I trust this message from the Word of God has been a blessing to you. If you need further assistance, do not hesitate to contact us at www.jglm.org or you can write to us at P.O. Box 742-947, Dallas, Texas 75374. If you need prayer or would like to request a prayer cloth, feel free to contact us. Now, right now I'm going to pray. God is going to set you free right where you are. God is not bound by time or distance. So in the name of Jesus, right now, I set you free. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole, be free in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. God bless you.